Hey everyone, it's me again. Uh, today is the first of three lessons dedicated to the Great Depression. So, today's lesson is more so uh, pictures and other types of things to kind of show life in the Great Depression. Um, and then, kind of why the Great Depression happened, uh, starting in 1929 and then into kind of the early Great Depression period, which is about 1932. And then next class, we'll do really the bulk of the response of the Great Depression, which is going to be the New Deal. So that's going to be all the programs enacted by FDR in uh, early 1933 and then into later years uh, to combat kind of all the issues brought about by the Great Depression. And then we'll kind of wrap that up on Friday and then look into why the New Deal was so significant, what it kind of meant, and... Uh, what kind of happened there. So that's kind of the game plan. So um, to start off, I think it'd be highly appropriate uh, to look at the Roaring Twenties. And we spent all of last week talking about the Roaring Twenties. And I put a question mark there because I think when we think about something like the Roaring Twenties, that term, we think of this, you know, excitement, good times, whatever. And by many senses, that is what uh, this is all about, you know, prosperity that we saw in the Roaring Twenties. We saw wealth, certainly, especially for our top wage earners. We saw consumerism reach kind of an all-time peak. New advertising methods to try to get at people. We saw the use of credit in order to buy automobiles and to buy the big kind of electronics and appliances and even into 1929, I think most people in the United States were thinking, it's all good, you know, there's no problems here, we're all having a good time. No, that's just not the case. And we talked about some of these things last class and last week, but a couple of things to kind of keep in mind. Number one, even throughout the 1920s, banks failed on a regular basis. So that signals to us that financial security and stability was not nearly as much as was so thought. We also know that what was being advocated for by the Republican administrations of uh, Hoover, Coolidge, and beginning with Harding was laissez-faire. Well, again, th there can be some advantages to laissez-faire, but do realize that that means a lack of government regulation in the economy and over corporations, and so that's not necessarily a good thing. And that will be problematic as we get into the last part of uh, the 1920s. And again, for your average individual, it's a big lack of self-discipline, uh, especially with credit consumption, people buying more than they actually had. Um, and that's all going to be problematic. So again, um, not a lot of long-term thought throughout the 1920s. A lot of thought of, hey, this is good. This is going to last forever. And unfortunately, it's really not. And it's going to come kind of to a big screeching halt. All right, we've talked about some of these already, but let me take a few minutes to kind of go more in depth on the causes specifically of the Great Depression. Um, number one is going to be overproduction. And this is something occurring both in the farms and the factories. A reminder that during World War I, far, both farms and factories could overproduce because there was all these soldiers to feed and they were sending food overseas to feed those soldiers and to feed the people at home in the European countries. That's all real great, but after the war is over, that demand is not there. But, you know, factories and farms, both trying to maximize profit, are still going to be producing a lot and a lot and a lot. And again, that's really incorrect uh, because that's going to completely mess things up. Another thing that you want to realize here is low wages will be a part of this already. Um, again, World War I was significant for workers. They had received more money, had done well. But with war ending in a more conservative government, a lot of the wage gains that, had, that workers had been a part of are going to go away. Um, and a lot of kind of the gains from the labor unions are also going to go away. So that's going to be bad for kind of your everyday common worker. Another thing that I want to mention here that's going to be really problematic is the growing gap between the rich and the poor. There's a few reasons why this is bad. Number one, obviously, you know, you try to make that gap not too big. But what it means is that 
There's going to be too much money in the hands of the people at the top. And so why that's so problematic for an economy, as far as an economy is concerned, is you need money more at the bottom, so more money is being spent more frequently. And that's not what we're going to see going on. And so that's really going to be problematic. That money in the top, instead of going towards like wages and salaries of workers, that again would have really, really helped to uh, disperse wealth and things like that, is instead going to be put into production methods. So again, you know, more factories, more uh, methods and practices to increase production. Well, no, that's not any good, okay? Because that's just going to drive the price of goods and things down, uh, which is going to be problematic as far as, um, you know, helping with the economy and kind of keeping it at bay. Again, yeah, not putting being put into consumption. Um, this is kind of something else, which is the fact that if the rich have 70 times more money than the poor, which actually in many cases is true, you would need them to spend 70 times as much in order to keep kind of the economy stimulated and the economy kind of going. And that's not what we're going to see at all. Instead, that money, again, is going to be held so much into the kind of like production methods and other things like that. It's not really going to work out very well here. We mentioned this already, huge overuse of credit by your average American. Um, that's going to be really, really bad because people are going to be purchasing way, way too much. So again, this is no good. And I think when we think about the 1920s, a huge thing we can think about is irresponsibility. Irresponsibility on the top, factory owners uh, not being more sensible with how they were spending their money, not being more sp sensible with how many items and other things they were producing, and really irresponsibility by our average Americans who were overusing credit um, in order to try to kind of fit in and be with the prosperity of the 1920s, which will also be no good. Again, our 1920s farmer, as depicted here in this cartoon, um, we see you know them trying to gain as much as they can over farming, uh, that's not going to be good for them. The price of crops is going to grow go down. Um, also remember, they're going to overwork the land. So one of the things that we're going to see is uh, the Dust Bowl. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Let me show you a couple images so I can depict this a little bit better. Again, I showed something similar to this uh, last week when we were talking about the automobile. And again, this is cool and this is real great. But the reality is um, these type of production methods will be applied not only to the automobile but also a lot of other things and that's not necessarily going to be good as there's going to be overproduction in the economy. Distribution of wealth in the 1920s. Look at this huge uh, difference that we're going to see here um, and this is going to be really really bad. Another thing that you can see here is that $2,500 a year is considered to be the minimum amount needed for a decent standard of living. Well what we can see is that a huge part of the population was even under that. So again, for as much as we talk about the wealth of the 1920s and the prosperity, there's huge groups of Americans that are not included in that. And if we really think about it, this wealth and prosperity is really confined to the upper classes. Again, just another look at this top 0.1% wealth share in the United States. And we can see here it really hits its peak um, in the 1920s. And then uh, this is supposed to show that, you know, recently it's hit pretty close to this as well. Similar to when we talk about wars and other things like that, when we do like our long-term causes, short-term causes, our immediate causes, all these causes that have been kind of brewing up since the 1920s are going to culminate into one single thing that's really going to kind of trigger the Great Depression, and that's going to be stock market crash in 1929. So let me kind of explain the way this goes. Um, so in March of 1929, Hoover takes over and kind of his opinion, the opinion of many Republicans, as well as many Americans, is the reason why they voted for him in 1928 is this prosperity, this wealth is going to last forever. So darn wrong. Okay. This is just not going to be the case at all. Again, signs that this wasn't going to work out and this was going to come to a halt. 
Uh, but uh, most people not listening to the signs, not listening to the warnings, and even for those that were, they did not really expect how dramatic things would go. And unfortunately, had they, maybe something would have been done. Our big problem in the stocks is something we talked about last week, which is kind of the wild speculation taking place. Um, that wild speculation in the 1920s had led to this continued upward shoot of the stocks in the stock market, and it really reached this all-time high, um, indicating that everything was so, so good um, in the stock market. What you also had, by the way, if you recall, was... Um, not only was you know speculation and confidence in the stock market high, but there was also massive manipulation of stocks as rich people kind of together would buy stocks at a low price all at one time, then that would shoot the price up, and then they would all sell when it was really, really high, and that would shoot the stocks down. A lot of that stuff going on, which is super, super unhealthy for the stock market because it's not really conveying what's actually going on. So those things are, are all going to kind of culminate. So in later 1929, Britain's having a hard time, and what they're going to do is they're going to raise their interest rates. And when this happens, this, as well as everything else that's going to be going on, is kind of going to set a, a little bit of a panic. And so our first major panic day is October 24th, 1929, a day that is referred to as Black Thursday. And on this day, there's huge selling that's going to occur um, in the stock market, primarily by foreign investors, as well as some uh, speculators and some others. And, and, and this is all of a sudden, like one of these big days that's going to occur where kind of showing us how vulnerable the stock market is and, you know, that really maybe this wealth and prosperity wasn't as good as many had made it out to see. Next day and into uh, Monday, some recovery of the stock market as, you know, companies are going to try to ease some of their in investors and kind of try to send a sign that everything is okay. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not going to be enough. And the big day of the stock market crash is Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929. And this is going to be the day when we see total panic selling on the stock market floor. Uh, over 16 million shares of stock will be sold. Um, and we'll talk about this a little more explicitly, but it's after this part where basically all will be lost. And what I mean by that is individual people that had invested in the stock market, they're going to lose their investments. Businesses are going to lose their value and things like that. And so all this kind of wealth and this prosperity and these feelings of, you know, this is the good times are again really going to come kind of screeching uh, to, to a quick halt. And so this is going to be uh, what is going to kind of signal in the Great Depression in late 1929. Here, by the way, is our newspaper headline from Black Thursday, and you can see people surrounding here trying to figure out kind of like where their money is and what's kind of going on. Again, remember, every in the, every day people had invested in the stock market, um, so this isn't something that's just going to impact like rich people. This is going to impact a lot of people. Um, here, by the way, you can see the value of the stock market, and you can see here that huge dip that's going to take place. Um, October uh, 29, 1929 on um, uh, Black Tuesday. And so you can see actually that things will actually get a little bit worse in the later part of 1929 into 1930. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the other things that go on here um, as it actually gets uh, progressively worse as the, de the depression continues into the early 1930s. Um, here again, we see people... Uh, crowding the streets, trying to kind of figure out what's going on amidst all the chaos. Where's their money? Uh, what's happening to the companies they work for? You know, this is not good. The effects of the crash are going to be severe, so let me kind of walk you through those so you can see these a little bit better. Um, in total, $40 billion will be lost in the stock market crash of 1929. To put that into perspective, this is more actually significantly more than the total cost of World War I for the United States. Okay, so just like that, vanished. Um, 
The biggest kind of impact of this is this leads to a business depression. So for companies that are being traded on the stock exchange, which were, you know, your big kind of companies and things like that, um, what this means is that you are worth nothing and you've lost your investors' money. Um, you know, speculation says that you're worth nothing. And so many businesses will be fo forced to close their doors. For the ones that are able to stay open, it also means making adjustments in order to do that. And so between the businesses that shut down, as well as the businesses that um, stay open but have to make adjustments, we're going to see a huge number of unemployed people. Um, by the end of 1930, so like one year into the Depression, about 4 million workers were jobless. Uh, by 1932, it will be about 12 million. Um, unemployment at kind of its peak in the Great Depression will be at about 25% nationally. And in some other cities that are affected really, really badly, those numbers will be much, much more 50%. 60%, things like that, because of how bad this depression hits. Um, for those that are able to stay employed, it's not going to be the same as wages and salaries are going to be cut pretty significantly. So again, if you are lucky enough to keep your job, it's not going to be like it was before. And one of the things that I always like to comment of on the Great Depression is the, is the Great Depression is not just about losing money. I mean, that's the biggest thing, obviously. But it's also about a loss of hope that's really going to um, embody the entire country. And we're going to go from this time of greatness and this all, oh, you know, things are great and this is so awesome, you know, et cetera, into a time of complete sadness. And that's really uh, the feeling and the moods throughout the Great Depression, uh, gloom, you know, and that's what we see going on there. I'm going to show you a couple pictures now. I have a lot of pictures throughout this PowerPoint. Um, here's one, this guy selling his car for $100 because he's lost all his money in the stock market. Here we see growing unemployment throughout the Depression. And we can see here how low unemployment was when the Depression started. And then look, by 1932, it's up to about 25%. And then we'll see some fluctuations as time continues on. This, by the way, becomes a very common sign throughout the Great Depression as soup kitchens and uh, free coffee and other things are offered to people in order to try to prevent them from going hungry. After the stock market crash, it's pretty clear that things are going to be bad, but things are going to kind of go from bad to worse. And um, there's a couple reasons for that. First off, again, after the stock market crash, there's an, a lot of uneasiness and a kind of a lot, a lot of questions about what really should be done. And again, there's no clear answer. Uh, something like this really hasn't happened before. But there's kind of some pressure on Hoover here in order to protect what existing American industry is left. And so there's an idea passed around by major industrialists who, you know, had supported Hoover as well as kind of your old guard conservatives in order to instill a uh, protective tariff. And this idea is to, you know, again, you know, protect American industry from European and foreign competition, especially in these, you know, tough times. The result that comes out is the Howie Smoot tariff in 1930. Now, the reason I put a few asterisks next to it is this. We've gone over quite a few tariffs that have occurred throughout U.S. history. If you remember any tariff throughout this entire class, this is the one that you need to remember because this makes the depression even worse. If you remember the depression, sorry, the tariff before this point had established tariffs rate at roughly 38.5%. After this, it jumps up to an average of 60%. This is huge. Okay, again, very seemingly unnecessary. And what this also does is this makes things bad for the European countries. They're going to see this as kind of like an economic warfare to them. Remember that these European countries were still recovering from World War I. And so the fact that this is going to make it that much harder for them to sell overseas is going to be really, really seen as bad. The other thing that you want to realize 
is that this does not do what it's supposed to do as far as really kind of protecting American industry or making life easier for Americans. If anything, it makes things harder as the price of goods will go up and America sinks even more into the depression. And what we're also going to see is European countries establishing their own retaliatory tariffs um, in order to kind of get back at the United States for what they're going to perceive as this very uh, big piece of injustice here. So this tariff is going to take the situation, make it, you know, it was already really bad, and now it's just going to get even worse. Um, by the way, this will be tough for Again, your average Americans always when and when we see tariff increases, it's always really bad for our farmers, and that's what this uh, political cartoon is trying to depict here, um, because this will not provide the relief uh, necessary. If you remember, one of the things we're going to say about Hoover is that um, he was an accomplished person uh, in the cabinet and other things like that, but um, he had a tough time kind of navigating the politics of of the presidency, and uh, this was not necessarily what he intended, but lobbyists and others, you know, this is what they wanted, and they were able to kind of manipulate uh, Hoover into getting this extremely high tariff passed. Okay, so let's talk about life in the Depression, and I'll say some comments here, but in order to understand life in the Depression, I really need to show you some pictures so first off, really, to be honest, and I don't really even need to joke here, but it's just the truth. Life in the Depression is depressing, okay? It is sadness. It is really, really tough times. One of the reasons for that is there is a complete helplessness to this. These people, they want to work, okay? It's not like they're just wanting to kind of loaf around and do nothing. There's just no jobs available for them. So imagine kind of those feelings of frustration, also, again, a reminder, if you don't have a job, you're not going to be able to pay your rent. You're not going to be able to pay your mortgage. So many homes will be foreclosed on. Many farms will be foreclosed on. And then people are going to get kicked out of apartments and other places that they're renting. And we're going to see huge, huge rates of foreclosures that will hit during the Great Depression. Because people lose all their money in the stock market, there's also a feeling that they're going to lose all their money in the banks. And at this point, there is no protection against that. So what you see, and this is what's depicted in this picture, is that people are going to start to run to the banks and pull all their money out of the banks. Well, again, if banks don't have mo money, they cannot really do any of their necessary functions. And so banks across the United States will fail in huge, huge numbers. And so this is really going to destroy what banks are designed to do as far as lending money and things like that. So this is really, really problematic. So bad do things get that even these little shanty towns will be built, which are going to be nicknamed Hoovervilles. Uh, showing people's hate and people's blame of President Hoover for the situation. And I got some pictures to show you, but this is just awful conditions uh, that you're going to see here. Packed quarters, um, you know, really, really tough times. But again, this is what people have to do. As far as something, and we'll look at this a little bit more, is we see something known as domestic upheaval. This refers to really families being pulled apart by the Depression. One of the big things you want to realize is that many men still kind of seeing themselves as the provider, and kind of the traditional gender role models, are going to blame themselves for their families' downfall and misery. And so many will leave their families. Many families will also be torn apart because of the stress from, you know, the money situation, which is also going to be really, really problematic. So that's going to be a huge theme that we're going to see throughout the Depression. What it also means is, and as you can imagine, way less kids will be born during the 1930s because it's just another mouth to feed. It's really not affordable for most people. Make matters worse, and we'll look at this a little bit more, the Dust Bowl will hit the Midwest a huge drought where many will have to leave and try to find work elsewhere, primarily in California. Um, so again, talk about an unstable and bad situation. 
let me show you some images to really show you what life was like during the Great Depression. Here, by the way, showing you bank failures. Again, look how many banks fail in the early Depression period in 1929, 1931, 1933. These are huge. And again, this is not normal. You can see the huge jump between the 1920s and what we see in the early 1930s. Again, total loss of confidence. Um, here we see, uh, again, even these posters uh, that kids have put up in order to uh, poke fun and, and really kind of place a blame on Hoover for the Depression. Some more here. This, by the way, is uh, from the Dust Bowl in the Midwest. Here's where the Dust Bowl is really going to affect. Again, we're talking about mostly Kansas, Oklahoma area. Hence, the people that come and try to migrate to California and other places known as Okies. And here are some of their major migration patterns as they, again, try to go west in order to farm or find work in other places. You have to realize, though, these other places are also suffering from the Depression, so it's not going to be necessarily as easy as just packing up and going elsewhere. It's going to be much more complicated and much more challenging than that. Here, by the way, some more kind of look at, at this whole situation. This, by the way, would be an example of a Hooverville. So you can see kind of these shanty homes that have been made basically from scraps, and this is where people will live together, um, kind of these communal little villages because of nowhere else really for them to go. You see again, this one even looks a little bit nicer, but these homes kind of literally spring up from the ground and are really, you know, the only place people can go to in these tough times. This picture is, is a really famous picture from the Depression. You see these two guys they're literally trying to solicit themselves into getting a job. And you can see here both these guys, uh, they're college grads. They're, um, you know, they've been employed before. This gentleman on the left is a war veteran. But the reality is, you know, no jobs for him or for anyone else. And this is life under the Depression. So you can imagine just, you know, the frustration. Here we see a family. Um, again, uh, this being a single mother, um, so again, this is a very common theme throughout the Depression as men will leave home in order to, you know, try to find work elsewhere or because of their frustration, just abandon the family altogether. Again, we see this here, um, you know, again, the mom having to take over the role as parent and then also as provider, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. These, by the way, if you ever heard the term uh, hobo, these are hobos, all right? These are men primarily, but women too, that would ride the trains in order to go somewhere else, maybe find work or, or other things. And again, you know, jumping on trains and, and riding them are very, very dangerous, but it's the lengths that people will go to in order to survive during the Depression. Here we see this man here, again, you know, a hobo. So we talked about women just briefly, but let me make some comments about minorities specifically during the Great Depression because the Great Depression impacts everyone and minorities will be no different. And by most stretches, you know, women, blacks, and Latinos, particularly Mexicans, will be treated much more harshly during the Great Depression. So again, men will many times feel guilty for them not being able to provide for their families during this time, and so many will abandon their families altogether. So this is going to be a really, really tough dynamic that we have to um, be cognizant of and paying attention to. Many women will not only have to take on the role of you know being a mother and, and, and many times a single mother, but they're also going to try to do things in order to keep the family afloat. One of those is to revive old industries to save money. And so what we're talking about here is things like sewing, things like canning food. These things save money. And these are things that many women will do in order to try to push through the tough times going on in the Great Depression. 
For blacks, life in the Great Depression is even worse than typical whites. One of the reasons why is because blacks are typically last on the totem pole in the sense that this is the phrase that usually accompanies blacks. Last one hired, first one fired. And so that's going to be very much the case. We'll look at this more specifically, but one of the arguments as to why the New Deal will not be very successful is because of the fact that it does not help much uh, for blacks. And so that's a very interesting thing to kind of consider here as well. Mexican workers will also be treated with a lot of hostility. If you remember during the 1920s, Mexican workers were a group that the U.S. government was more than happy to let in, you know, closeness of proximity, hey, come in, do work, whatever. But with a shortage of jobs and other problems, uh, there's going to be a lot of issues that are going to come into play. Um, so during the 1930s, what we'll see is actually a large amount of deportation um, of Mexicans, including many citizens who will be deported for lack of jobs. And so, again, that's a really, really sad reality, but one that will occur uh, during the Great Depression. Here's a newspaper headline from Denver um, in regards to Mexicans being uh, shipped back to Mexico. So, again, uh, no real... Um, differentiation in this case between citizens and non-citizens, uh, Mexican workers subjected to going back. It's really interesting when we get to World War II, when there's going to be kind of the same uh, huge overwhelming job opportunities as in World War I, um, the United States government will kind of change their mind and say, oh, come on back. You know, it's it really shows us kind of the contradictories of uh, U.S. immigration policy, but this is one of those times U.S. very much closing the door. Here we see um, some uh, Me Mexicans returning back to Mexico during the Depression on the trains. This is actually a cartoon from the Los Angeles area uh, looking at this um, as a lot of Mexicans had immigrated into the Los Angeles area. Here we see total immigration uh, by decade, and you can see here the huge, huge decrease when we were looking at the 1930s um, from previous uh, decades. It's really, really interesting to see huge, huge drop-off, and again, uh, that primarily has to do with the fact that simply no job opportunities, so that was always a huge attraction for immigrants to come to the United States, also like stability and other things like that just non-existent during this time period. So we will not see this huge pull to come to the United States during this. Um, also looking here specifically, uh, I like this one. Why can't you give my dad a job? Almost one of those things where uh, th those real feelings of like inadequacy of not being able to provide for the family and kind of the traditional gender roles, we absolutely see that in the early depression. Here, by the way, we see a woman taking on some of these uh, earlier practices. Uh, we assume what she's going to get herself into is like the canning of foods here. Again, a good money-saving technique, a good way to preserve foods and keep them for long periods of time. That's absolutely something that women will be involved in during the world during the sorry the Great Depression period. Um, here we see blacks and their experience here, uh, trying to still work during the Great Depression. It's clear that there's a serious problem in the early uh, Great Depression period. President Hoover, obviously there's going to be a lot of pressure on Hoover to kind of jump in and do something. Um, and the reality is there seemed to be at least initially successful optimism based on Hoover's past. Um, again, this was the Secretary of Commerce during uh, the very prosperous administrations of Harding and and Coolidge, and so it's kind of like, okay, if anyone can navigate, you know, money and commerce and, and these kind of shaky waters, uh, this guy might be able to do it. Maybe if this was a little bit more of a manageable situation, not really manageable here, and so this will be much more than Hoover would be equipped to deal with, and uh, he's going to be un unsuccessful here. There's also another problem, a big, big problem that Hoover is going to face, the reality is Hoover would like to be this guy who's the hero of the Great Depression. You know, that, that guy that's kind of able to step up and, you know, be that person that comes up with those great policies that are able to get the country out of the 
kind of the slumps. But if you recall from last class, Hoover was a big believer in self-help and individualism. The idea here that government handouts and government assistance was not what was necessary. So because of that, and because of his beliefs in the idea of individualism and the idea of government not you know, being this ultimate solution to, to problems, it's going to make it so his solutions are going to be limited. And the reality is from 1929, late 1929, when the stock market crashes, uh, for the rest of his presidency, which will be until 1932, spoiler alert, he will definitely not be reelected. The depression will very much worsen. Unemployment rises, you saw that in some of the graphs, banks continue to fail, uh, desperation, hopelessness becomes even more rampant. So uh, things do not do very well. One of the things that Hoover does do is he tries to advocate for assisting those at the top. So he will sign some pieces of legislation and will give some funding to railroads, banks, and rural credit corporations. And the idea behind this is something we've kind of talked about before, which is trickle-down economics. If you give money and relief to those at the top, so like railroads who provide jobs, then they should hopefully have enough money to employ you know, more people at the bottom, and then they'll have more money in turn to spend, and everything will be nice. Okay, even today, trickle-down economics is going to draw a lot of criticism, because the idea here is it doesn't really, like, trickle down enough. Certainly during the Depression, it's just not enough, and the reality is the Depression is going to need a more kind of radical solution than just providing money to those at the top. But because of Hoover's belief in self-help, individualism, because of his advocacy for big business and corporations, that's really all he's going to be comfortable with doing. So uh, we will not see huge government intervention during Hoover's uh, presidency. This quote, by the way, for Hoover kind of illustrates that our grandfathers, fathers, self-reliant, rugged, courage... They asked only for freedom of opportunity and equal chance. In these uh, lies the real basis of American democracy. They and their fathers gave a genius to American institutions that distinguished people from any other in the world. So we'll talk about this a little bit more, but those beliefs are going to really sit in the way of Hoover doing anything too, too drastic to deal with the Depression. Uh, some more peacetime choice, American system of rugged individualism and a European philosophy of diametrically opposed doctrines, doctrinisms of paternalism and socialism. Um, there will be calls for kind of, you know, again, government assistance, which can be perceived as socialism, uh, but Hoover very much opposed to that, and so he will not pave that way. That being said, you know, it's clear more needs to be done, so what are some things that will happen in the early uh, years of the Depression, Hoover will dedicate and get a spending bill for $2 billion for public works projects from Congress. Uh, the idea here is that these projects can help improve U.S. infrastructure, but also get people back to work because obviously there's going to be a job. The most significant uh, and notable achievement of Hoover's public works Pro projects is going to be the Hoover Dam. You might have been to it before. Um, and this is going to be, by the way, something that creates um, flood control, helps the irrigation, electric power. So there's use for it. Um, but again, going back to kind of the quote, what we say, uh, Hoover will be very hesitant to do anything that would be perceived as being too socialist. And so because of that, we will not see uh, more kind of government intervention taking place. In order to continue funding those at the top, our big corporations and things like that, he establishes the RFC, which is the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which will lend out about $500 million. Again, this is indirect relief given to state and local governments, banks, railroads, etc. So it's not any money that is going to be given to individuals. It's still only to those at the top. Um, the RFC will draw criticism 
obviously for not giving relief to those at the bottom and only providing relief to those at the top. The other thing, though, is that these are loans. And so it's one of those things where it's going to get some criticism as kind of what was being done here was almost self fulfilling as the government was going to gain some profits on loans and other stuff like that. So um, not really what the country needs in this kind of time of crisis. A uh, notable thing going to happen for workers, Norris LaGuardia Anti-Injunction Act. All this does is kind of as the name implies, it's going to make sure that uh, no, no injunctions can be imposed for strikers. So remember, injunctions are when, you know, you, you send in typically uh, troops and other things to stop a strike, and, and that's actually going to be outlawed during this period. So that's good for our workers, uh, but that's about it. Um, the American people frustrated with Hoover's approach, um, you know, going to be upset and things like that about it. Um, and so in 1930, um, and so in 1930, uh, Republicans will start to lose actually, um, in, in the Congress and things like that. And by 1932, um, that's going to be more the case for the Democrats. Uh, look at the Hoover Dam here. Okay, so let's talk about some more chaotic times, and we're definitely going to see this taking place uh, when we talk about just complete chaos. Um, hard times for everyone, including war, World War One veterans. We know that the veterans, they felt like they really uh, needed more attention, and they needed more uh, you know, kind of rewards for their role in World War One, And if you recall, in the 1920s, they were given some payments, uh, f f you know, bonus pay, basically. Uh, but one of the agreed-upon bonus pay was not set to be paid to them until 1945. And for these people, this just was not going to be good enough, all right? They felt like their money was due to them. They, they couldn't continue on. You know, this isn't going to work out. So about 20,000 of them will come to Washington, D.C. in order to air their grievances kind of at the door of the federal government. This is actually something we'll see um, in other rights movements. It's like if you're protesting, why not just bring your issues right to the forefront of the government itself? Um... This group is going to be known as the Bonus Army, so named because they literally want their bonus right here in 1932. And again, their demand is simple. Give us our money now. All right, we're unemployed. We're struggling. We helped you out big during the wartime. You know, give us what it is. They're going to set up riots in order to protest. They're going to set up unsanitary camps um, in order to protest their condition and Hoover will order them to be evicted. Um, however, the eviction does not exactly go as planned as these people are aggressively evicted with tear gas and bayonets, much, much worse than Hoover had planned. The reality is this is just kind of a capping moment of the huge hate people had for Hoover. Um, by 1932, he had become definitely the most hated man in America Definitely the person where all the blame of the depression was put on, and really, um, no solution that he has um, is going to be adequate or really going to work. So this is going to be really, really problematic. So by 1932, again, that's going to be the next election year. What's happened? We're about three years into the depression. Well, first off, unemployment's hit about 25 percent. All right, so the unemployment problem has only gotten worse. People universally are angry. The voters are angry. And by the way, this is why voting is such a critical tool. By your ability to vote, you have the power to put people into office that you like, but you also have the ability to get people out of office that you do not like. And so by 1932, it's kind of clear for most Americans, we do not like Hoover. This is not working. We need something else. Um, I kind of forgot to mention this only because we briefly talk about it uh, for the election of 1928, but also because I was going to return to it. In 1928, that prosperity, you know, kind of election, Hoover 
said in his campaigns, a chicken in every pot, a car in every garage. The idea here that, uh, uh, this might seem weird, but chicken at the time, you know, kind of more expensive, um, that this was going to be a big deal, okay? And that prosperity was going to continue for the American families, and, you know, that, that was all going to be good stuff. So darn wrong, okay? Not even close as we continue on here, and things had gotten so much worse. Republicans will renominate Hoover, not very energetically, but just kind of because they don't have anyone else and kind of on this idea that, hey, you know, maybe things will get better and maybe this will be fine. You know, okay, you know, let's see. Not very enthusiastic, but, you know, maybe. And by the way, I think this picture is really good on showing just how much things had, had changed in a short amount of time between the, the roaring 20s and, you know, our Depression period. It's against this backdrop that we're going to see the Democrat nominee come into play, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, a couple things about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Number one, great education, um, as well as great experience. So that's going to be all good stuff to kind of look at um, in regards to this. He was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He uh, was involved in the state of New York, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, so he was somebody that had some good political experience, Ivy educated. Um, he had polio, which had left him in a wheelchair. Uh, that being said, he never used that to kind of show any weakness. He was partially paralyzed, but he had trained himself to still uh, semi-walk and be mobile, which is really, really interesting. Uh, we never really see any photographs of FDR in the wheelchair because he never wanted to portray that. Um, so again, kind of an interesting thing to, to kind of look at. He had been the governor of New York during the early part of the Depression. And what had happened there was that he had advocated for a lot of state programs and state funding to combat the Depression. So in a similar way, that's going to be kind of his hope for the U.S. government as a whole. Hey, let's push programs to fight the Depression through the government. Okay, that's how we're going to fix this. This whole idea of Hoover's self-help individualism, he's going to say no. Okay, it just doesn't work. And so that's significant to kind of acknowledge and look at there. And when we talk about FDR, we're talking about a guy with great presence and great political appeal. FDR was a distant cousin of Teddy Roosevelt. But I like to compare the two in the sense that both were really able to use their appeal to the people and their popularity to push forward their agenda in, you know, changing in different times. FDR more so than Teddy as far as difficult times. But that's going to really help and make this possible. It's because of that that there's going to be a lot of excitement for the Democratic nominee. And the reality is, if you think about the elections of the 1920s, there hasn't. There's been a lot of divide within the Democratic Party, um, split tickets, and then they put somebody up and it's like, oh, God, I don't want this guy, you know, whatever else. But now, all of a sudden, things are going to really come into play here and get a lot better. One of the things that FDR is going to say during his campaign is that he is going to promise... A new deal. And what he's going to say here is this, you know, I pledge you, I pledge my, myself, I pledge to a new deal for the American people. What exactly that new deal was, that was kind of a mystery at this point during the campaign, but he does specify that what's been going on now is not working. So there needs to be a change. Again, we see the campaign button here in 1932 for a new deal. That quote that I mentioned to you, I pledge you, I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. Again, this will be the, the big rallying cry. I just found this, you know, I think that's kind of funny. Okay, so let's talk about the election 1932 to wrap this up. So Hoover, obviously, the Republican nominee, FDR, the Democrat nominee. What we're talking about here, what's the main topic? Obviously, it's the economy. Okay, it's obviously how to deal with the Depression. A vote for Hoover is basically saying you're advocating for individual initiative, individualism, self-help. But if you vote for FDR, you're basically voting for something else, which would be much more government intervention and regulation in the economy. When the election is completed, FDR has a huge, huge, huge victory. And you see it right here in the map. Really, 
the only states that Hoover takes are very much Republican strongholds, uh, but everything else really goes to the direction of FDR. Um, I'll show you the popular vote as well, but FDR dominates that also. So once again, showing that by 1932, people are looking for a change. Okay, People don't want to continue with the quote-unquote fake prosperity of the 1920s. People that voted for FDR voted basically for him for one of two reasons. Number one, they were pro-New Deal. They I liked this idea. But the other reason was that they were anti-Hoover. Okay, So again, uh, you had just as many people voting f for FDR um, because they were excited about the New Deal as you did people that were just so sick of Hoover and didn't want to continue. Um, just a reminder that a president technically is elected in November, but does not take office, at least at this point, until March of the following year. Um, now it's January, but it's going to be a four-month period, lame duck period, basically, where the Depression will worsen under Hoover, and basically everyone's ready for FDR to take over and get his program into action. This is a more specific electoral map um, for the election of 1932. Just look at the domination from Roosevelt. Um, 472 electoral college votes, so nearly 90%. But then also look here at the uh, popular vote, almost uh, 58%. So it's a pretty um, severe you know, victory, and it's a pretty resounding call that people do not want to see this continuing uh, issues, continuing problems occur. Okay, so that wraps up today. Thanks. I know a little bit longer, but a lot of meaty stuff. So based on today's lesson, I put some questions in the Google Classroom. Um, no need for big answers. I just need a, a little something. Okay, I just want to make sure you watch the video and you comprehended the lesson. There's no questions, problems, anything like that. And then next class, Wednesday, 1015. Okay, before then, you'll see this in Google Classroom. Instead of taking like traditional notes for a reading quiz, because that's not really effective at this point, there is a sheet that I've created, and it goes over the New Deal programs. It just gives mostly abbreviations. Go to your book, and if you need to go online, just write out what the program is in full, and then a brief, brief description about what the program was supposed to do. Uh, we'll build up on this as we go through, and obviously after we talk about them, I'll have you do some more work with them. But just for now, it will make it a lot easier when I go through the lesson if you already have familiarity with the program at least a little bit. So please complete that sheet. I'll give you points for it, obviously. And as always, thanks. I appreciate it. We'll talk soon. Have a great one.